Okay, well, so hello. Welcome to this Pop Gnosis episode of Talk Gnosis. Today we're going to be talking about that Michael Bay Gnostic classic, The Island. I'm Jason Memmel, and I'm uh, joined with my co-host, uh, Rebecca Skolnick and Deacon John. Um, if you're new to Gnosticism, the absolute shortest way I can describe it is that it's a kind of deeper knowing, one that you can't learn or be taught, but maybe that you can discover through faith, mystical exploration, or in my favorite way, art. It can be described as remembering a deep connection, something that you didn't know you forgot. Uh, a lot of older traditions also have like whole cosmologies of figures and levels of of, uh, of pleroma and and like planes of existence that are either trying to keep us from remembering or at the very least are in the way of remembering or they're actually trying to help us remember. On Popnosis, we take a look at the culture around us through that same kind of Gnostic lens. Sometimes the connections are direct and easy to see because the, the art makers are intending it and sometimes they're lurking just underneath and are completely unintentional and need to be uncovered with some digging. So that's what we're going to do here. And like I said, we're going to talk about The Island, a 2005 film uh, made by Michael Bay. Um, and it's got uh, Scarlett Johansson and Ewan McGregor in it as two clones who, uh, we, actually, we don't even know that they're clones. Spoiler the alert. Yeah. <laughs> by yeah. the way, there's going to be spoilers. lots of spoilers. Everybody stop what you're doing. Watch The Island. You'll think of later. And... It's about clones. <laughs> yeah. It's about clones. Well, yeah. So true. It is. It is a bit of a spoiler. So it is about two characters who are living in this highly structured world that yet somehow has these small little problems with it and they're trying to figure out what's going on and then you, they end up discovering that they're inside a con entirely constructed world and that they are clones meant for uh for wealthy people to like fix their organs and that kind of thing um but yeah i did kind of jump the shark there uh by j immediately letting you know that they're clones um but it is essentially like a uh, it's if Michael Bay made the Matrix. It's um, it's got a bunch of things about like the world being controlled, but noticing small problems. It's escaping from world to another world. Um, uh, but it's also because it's Michael Bay. It's got uh, like action scenes and like it, it, cameras swiveling around characters as they look despondently at weird landscapes and and like yeah it's just uh and it's endless slow-mo endless less. amounts yeah less. endless amounts of slow-mo just exactly yeah every yeah shot. <laughs> um it's also i would say way more tongue-in-cheek than the matrix um it's like I, I joked that it's like the sponsored Matrix because like there's like Pepsi I think has a spot in it and like or no maybe it's Coke but anyway yeah like uh, oh, a lot so, of brands so many brands. <laughs> brands I have so many notes about brand like product placements in this movie so we'll we'll definitely have to talk about that well I mean maybe that's a great place to start like uh, yeah what are, what are some of the branding choices that you noticed. Okay, so first of all, I have to say that I do agree that this, I, I well, disclaimer that I loved this movie in high school, <laughs> and I have not seen it since. And so watching it again, I was like, oh, I used to love this movie. And I think it's because Michael Bay's philosophy peaks in high school. Like, that's where he ends. <laughs> Something about it, like, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I can see why I liked this then. Um, but it really is kind of like the Matrix, the Giver, the Hunger Games, like every sci-fi philosophy movie kind of rolled into one. Like there are elements of everything. Mm -hmm. So one of those is this futuristic, like it's set in the future and the Earth has gone through this great contamination. So that is why they are told that they're underground. And so then when they come out into the real world, first of all, this was made in 2005. The real world, the future is 2019. <laughs> and I have to say that watching it in 2023, knowing what happened between 20, well, knowing what 2019 actually was, and no then kidding. like what's happened since 2019 was a mind boggling <laughs> experience. <laughs> um, but the first thing that really caught my eye was that in 2019, when you come out onto the street, you can have a internet access anywhere through MSN. That was, <laughs> MSN was a like- MSN search, not even Bing yet. <laughs> I know, MSN search was like the futuristic 
like internet access point. And that cracked me up right <laughs> off the bat. MSN. <laughs> Uh, the funniest, is... Oh, sorry. The, the funniest no, no, thing for me when, when it comes to product placement, because as uh, as Dee was explaining, right, the, uh, the this idea that there's this worldwide contamination is a lie. They they tell the the clones to keep them complacent, to keep them in the bunker, to keep them from wanting to get out. So you know they say there's there's been this 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 uh, this huge disaster, right? And we live in a post apocalyptic world. And but yet th there's all this product placement in the in the bunker. <laughs> um, so you know there's there's a scene where you and Gregor is putting on his shoes and you know he takes out a, a, a futuristic drawer of shoes and they're all pumas uh they're uh, they're probably <laughs> drinking uh, uh aqua vita um and they're just no like like it doesn't if you think about it for 10 seconds it doesn't make any sense but it is uh it's, it's very very funny um i think i think we're going to say the words the matrix a lot which you know it's not like the which is a very in some ways particularly the third one uh it can be very sophisticated um philosophical movies but at the same time they're not you know they're not the deepest movies in the world they're still action films right and this yeah. is this is definitely like it, you know if if the wachowskis were were given um lobotomies right um and, <laughs> and and told to write a script but but there's no way this movie wouldn't have been made if it hadn't been for the matrix and its success and you know they're, 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 there's it's not just that they're they're drawing on a lot of the same sci-fi tropes right there, there's definitely like you know a little little hints of rip off here and there so Especially like when they find like you know the uh, the, the clone farm when when the, when the when our clone heroes discover the clone farm right that that's very similar to the to the scene of Neo waking up and 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 all mm -hmm. sorts of all sorts of uh, of other uh, parallels. Um, B, I, I I will tell you this. So I I, um, uh, I I saw this movie in the theaters. Um, I saw it. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, yeah, I saw it with my girlfriend at the time. Uh, who I who I, I I can't remember why. I do like action films. I I do kind. I do like Michael Bay. I have no idea why we went to go see this. Uh, that said, uh, I'm sorry, Laura. I don't think we ever saw any good movies together. Uh, <laughs> I think the other one, the other one I remember watching in theaters together was um, uh, Revenge of the Sith. So, uh, but oh, I feel like yeah, great choices. <laughs> I feel like it was just whatever was was playing. Um, uh, however, all that said, I made my wa my wife watch it. So time is a flat circle. Uh, bringing it all back together, <laughs> and, and we both actually enjoyed it more more than we thought that we would. I, I would actually say that it was better than I remembered, um, mm. and I, I would actually rank it as one one of the better Michael Bay films because what the only other good one is um, uh, The Rock, um, like the. Uh, <laughs> So there's not there's not a very high bar. That said, enjoyed it more than I thought. You know, is it good? Absolutely not. And I, I feel like every time I'm going to guess on the show, I'm a fan of short movies. I'm going to be like, this movie is so long, though. It's so long. It's, <laughs> this it's... movie is so long. This movie is about a solid half hour longer than it needs to be. And it's totally. in the action sequences. Like, yeah. <laughs> I would actually like to see a cut of this movie without some of the action sequences. I was just about to say that. There needs to be a fan edit, right? And particularly because the last last half is just a chase scene, you know, and a lot yeah. of the action scenes are related to it being a chase scene, and you you don't need an hour and a half chase scene. Okay, um, so... I'll make the fan edit. You've convinced <laughs> me. <laughs> and then we will do a live stream uh, and like watch it together. Do not tempt me. <laughs> I am tempting you. This is exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> but but I, but I would say compared to like the Transformers movies, like this is this movie is, is Citizen Kane. I need something more advanced <laughs> than a Citizen Citizen. This this movie is uh, I can't think of anything funny. But um, it's yeah, it's it's miles and and shoulders and tons uh, ahead. You know, even watching it, you know, I've come not to to bury the island but to praise it. Um, <laughs> even watching it, you know, I was thinking because of course there's tons of uh, the tons of terrible CGI. Um, tons of uh of, of bad um green screening but it, it's still like i still found it more tactile and thrilling than than modern action films right than like a lot of superhero movies where there there at least was some actual stunt people and some actual things in the frame blowing up that weren't just cgi there actually yeah, were yeah. uh uh you know uh people falling things exploding uh what have you my wife also did turn to me at one point and said oh because you're because you're a male did you go did you get a frill from this look that thing went boom that that thing went boom and then that thing <laughs> <laughs> and boom and i'm like yeah kind of 
<laughs> well, I do have to say that before when you brought up the Wachowskis, like it's like if the Wachowskis weren't trans women, that would be the island. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like, truly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it it but it is like a, in some ways a stunning movie like there are beautiful shots the coloring is exactly what you would think from sci-fi and michael bay mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but at the same time like the blues are deep like even when all of the clones are in their white suits out on those red rocks like i there is attention to detail in this movie and like artistry in this movie even in some of the tech stuff mm -hmm. uh that i do really appreciate so i too am kind of here to praise the island um, even though the one brand that I did not say was MSN and Michelob Light. <laughs> Michelob Light was like the featured beer of 2019. <laughs> you know, there's a, um, what, what was I going to say there? Uh, um, the, like what you just said there about the uh, Wachkowskis and be it like, I think there's something also interesting, like the, the matrix is like a lot of it is about like transcending yourself, you know, yeah. like, tra like literally being able to experience a change of self. Whereas what one thing about this movie is that it does feel like it's sort of a recapitulation of self, you know, mm. like that the, um, that the, 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 the characters sort of come out of this whole experience even more like sort of masculine and feminine and hero. And if that makes sense, like it doesn't, um, uh, versus it like, uh, uh, versus the, the matrix feeling like it kind of left, a a question about what these characters could be. Like I, I had no question about what, what these characters could be. So there's sort of a, where that takes me is it, it also goes to something, to something that, um, John was saying about like, um, you know, like we've been comparing it to the matrix and like often being somewhat derogatory in that comparison. I wonder if there's like a, if this is like, um, in a Gnostic perspective, if this is like a, like a, a, um, like it's clearly a matrix ripoff. Like there, there's, there was a clear production meeting where they said, how can we do this again? Mm -hmm. You know, this was hot. How can we make it again? But like from a sort of more psychic perspective, like, is this a, a slightly like a like a, a muddier echo you know of of these gnostic ideas like a um it's the 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 lens is 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 has more d dirt on it if that makes sense in some cases quite literally <laughs> um quite literally yeah. no i think you're on to something because i do think and that's i think what i meant by michael bay's philosophy peaked like at a high school level mm -hmm, <laughs> just because mm -hmm immediately you are thrown into quite a hero, like a quite an obvious hero's journey. So you have, which I think it's funny you said Echo. So you have Lincoln Six Echo. That is Ewan <laughs> McGregor's like actual name. And the first, like the opening to the movie is this dream that he's having. So already you're very immersed in like metaphor and symbolism and this visual language of like fragmentation. And immediately he Lincoln Six Echo is like this very childlike questioning you know, person. And, and then he has the mentor doctor, Sean Bean, RIP in every movie he's ever been in. <laughs> <laughs> Sean loves to die. Bean is, is like the doctor who you're not sure at first if he's like a mentor figure or not. But I feel like there are these, it's a very obvious philosophical story kind of right off the bat. But mm -hmm. you're right. I, I think it is um either obvious or like weak in its storytelling in a way that yeah it's just it, i mean it's not subtle yeah well and my, my wife actually... right away was like oh they're clones because i didn't let her <laughs> i didn't let her see any spoilers or read the <laughs> or watch the trailer um and uh she was also like i i don't think i don't think this island is good we didn't even we haven't even explained what the island is, by the way. But maybe Jason, oh, you're haven't. about to say something. We maybe, haven't. Maybe. <laughs> There's We're all the synopses, so everyone just needs to watch the movie. You just need to yeah. watch the movie. The you know, it's it's interesting you say that too about it being unsubtle. Like there's a uh I've been even talking with friends about that in terms of storytelling of like there's there's a there's often a desire to be clear in storytelling, but then I think there's actually that instinct can go to the point of being too clear, you know. Um, making everything so obvious, like 
this is the hero. This is a bad place. Like, you know, Sean Bean is, is like, you know, clearly doesn't have his best intentions in mind. Also, I have to say, so Sean Bean is the, like we, you know, Austin, he starts out as this possible good doctor, but then he clearly becomes the demiurge, the guy controlling the, the artificial world. Um, and then I'm like, but he dies. Is this like a Nietzschean thing? Like God is dead? Like Sean Bean slash God is dead? You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, unlike the... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, you know, probably unlike the Matrix. You know, the, the Matrix is is deliberately Gnostic, right? They're sitting down, they're reading Nag Hammadi, they, they are mm -hmm. referring directly to Gnosticism, where, you know, this perhaps, I mean, still, Gnosticism still, like, it's it's popular with creatives, right? But as you're saying, Jason, they're probably getting it secondhand through through the Matrix, but that said, you know, uh, the, the screenwriters are thinking of their Philosophy 101 class, right? Like, the, yeah. like you know, these themes are deliberate, and then they sort of um, uh, coagulate into, into Gnosticism, because obviously, you you know, if you do take a philosophy 101, they're, they're going to tell you about Plato's cave, right? Which is a very important uh, uh, allegory for uh, for the Gnostics. Uh, and they mm -hmm. refer to it over and over again. And it's um, um, and when people hear Plato's cave, uh, if they know Gnosticism first or they've seen the Matrix or what have you, you know, they're going to make that connection. So so obviously they, they were thinking about Plato's cave when they wrote this. There is some sort of like, you know, I, I don't think, think it's that deep, but they, they are thinking of, of some kind of light satire of religion, right? Like the like mm -hmm. the doctor is supposed to be God. They're supposed to be Adam and Eve. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence. The first thing that they see when they get out is is a snake, right? The uh, the bunker is probably supposed to be Garden of Eden. You know, you combine that with Plato's cave, uh, and you you kind of instantly have uh, have Gnosticism. So I, I actually going back and rewatching it, you know, I found the Gnostic themes and the the possibility of of mapping some of the characters and events one to one to the to the mythologies to be you know stronger than I thought it would be you know I thought mm -hmm. it'd be more of a read in but I think it does have these these direct influences that allow for a gnostic reading more than than some places where we might be you know okay are we is this our interpretation so that mm -hmm. that's just what I wanted to say from from what Jason as uh, uh, spurring on uh the, the, the does this mean the death of the demiurge perhaps so uh but uh <laughs> sorry so uh, no not at all and I mean yeah. I think uh it's also um um, it's possible that uh, maybe the, the filmmakers found an, a, a lost text of Plato's Island. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, they, they do make blatant uh, religious, like it, but through the Steve Buscemi character. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he says, uh, he says something. So he plays, Steve Buscemi plays this uh, work, like he's working on the, on the society essentially mm -hmm. like keeping it running and he knows of the outside world and he's become friends with Ewan McGregor and he gives him things from the outside world that he's not supposed to but uh, you know Lincoln is very curious and keeps coming to him to ask questions about about the world and uh, so, you know, he, I think he enjoys like the conversation, but he knows that it could get him in trouble. So he's kind of playing and he does end up helping them along the way. Uh, but he says something, it's a direct quote that I wrote down. Like, you know, when you talk like something about the island or, or the doctor, it's like when you talk to the sky or whatever, like God is the guy who ignores you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they do make very blatant, like anti-religious references throughout. I actually thought the um like when I when I finished the movie, I thought ethically they posed a lot of questions that they abandoned. Like Definitely. they were like, at the end, all the clones <laughs> get out, and it's like, okay, but then like what happens? <laughs> they're just loose in the world as like they're educated to the level of like a 15-year-old and they all have these crazy fragmented memories. And okay, but they're just like out there but they're free <laughs> but they're free <laughs> so but i i feel like that that's kind of how i feel as an adult as well i'm like me a former baby can just lease a car what so. <laughs> i I, I think it's fun. It's it's fun for me. So you actually get um, dopamine hits by making connections, right? So mm. uh, and uh, you know, there's a 
a temptation with with a show like this. I mean, the the entire show that you folks are doing or um, uh, doing these topics, where where it just turns into you know this character represents this in the mythology, right? Or this idea is exactly like this in the mythology. And, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. and I don't think this show does that. Um, and it, but, but it's kind of fun for the people doing it, but it's not always fun to listen to. And I think it's a uh, at the end of the day a lesser form of analysis, right? So that that's my song and dance, so I can just start doing that. But I did really like uh, connecting to, to Jason's in. <laughs> intro um and and be as you were saying uh, uh lincoln echo four or five whatever ewan mcgregor um he uh <laughs> the, the movie actually opens because he has dreams and memories from the the man that he's cloned from which which is an accident it's it's something that that's uh that that the is not supposed to happen they're not supposed to have the memories of those of those people that they're that they're cloned from and of course that idea is both very platonic and very gnostic right uh, just like jason was saying is you're you're recovering something you're getting these memories back you are getting uh this this truth back which has always been there but has been obscured by these forces and systems um and and what have you so again you know if, if the when it comes to doing the one-to-one -one, it, it, it there actually is sort of a an accidental sophistic sophisticated um uh, uh threshold of um uh, of Gnosticism there uh, that, that I think is uh, is definitely makes watching this a, a little bit more fun because you know folks as I said I I, I enjoyed it a lot more than, than I thought I would it, uh, um, but it's 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 a dumb movie it's not a good movie um, but um, it's uh, it's a smart dumb movie it's a you know, smart dumb movie it's a smart you know and there's also kind of a thought here too like I I hear what you're saying John about not um, not going too far or like or, or not taking the association the ability to make an association as a truth. Um, and I, and I don't think that's what we're, that's not what I want to try to do here. Um, uh, it, I think for me, I think the, the benefit is more like when you make the association that it kind of ho can hopefully lead you to think more about those, the ideas that, the, that are, are associated to those associations, if that makes sense. Like, uh, what is it to like, to notice that your world is a little off, you know? Mm. Um, uh, wh what is it to to challenge that you know um, uh, it, and, and also like what is it to to like engage with the meanings that are being like handed to you versus the ones you're choosing like I think a lot of that can can be fun it is also just as you say it's the part of the whole fun of the show is the dopamine hit of like what about this and what about this and also definitely not that like <laughs> you know um, uh, but there was something I was going to mention there uh but I think like, yeah, I think there is also, I think the, um, the, the, the feeling like whether or not it's a photocopy of the matrix, there's also kind of maybe like a, a, from a optimistic side for me that like, that these are maybe where the good version of the idea can slip, slip in, you know, um, in a less subtle, less, less, uh, society challenging text. Um, you know, this might be rebelling against religion, but it's not rebelling against capitalism, you know, or individualism, you know. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, but it, but it carries it sort of carries within it the carrier wave of these maybe more subtle and challenging ideas. Like that's, I don't know, maybe I'm optimistic, but uh, yeah. I don't think you are because what I'm so glad you said capitalism because I we've talked about how I think. It is not representative of 2019, but <laughs> what I thought was really interesting and stems from, like, I think there's a lot of Gnostic philosophy and theory and conversation around the body and the body's limitations and whether or not we see the body as like a positive, these are very crude terms, but like a mm -hmm. positive or a negative, if it's, you know, what does the material world mean, especially if made by the demiurge. So I think the um, the conversation of like science or health and technology in this movie is really interesting, especially through a capitalist lens. Like watching it, I was like, yeah, I feel like rich people would absolutely if they didn't. So one of the pieces of the cloning is that the company has lied to the clients and said, that the clones that they're making are not human. They're not sentient. They don't have thoughts or feelings, you know, like you're not really doing anything bad. And so one of the problems with 
Lincoln and Jordan, who is Scarlett Johansson, getting out into the real world, one of the issues is that it's going to blow the company's cover of uh, them real, like their clients realizing that they are actually making human beings that they're then killing for organs, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I, but I could totally see that as like, if we had the technology to clone, I do think people would unfortunately purchase this insurance, especially like in America. I know y'all are Canadians and, <laughs> and blessed in this regard, but like in America, the state of our healthcare system is so dire that I absolutely see this as like a potential possibility if science and tech were to move kind of in that consume in that um area of like consumer marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. And, you know, if you listen to some other uh, Gnostic podcasts, I'll probably tell you that there are underground cloning facilities for the rich, but uh, we're not. We're and not you know what? Rich. There yeah. might be. There might I be. don't know. There might, be. <laughs> there, there might be, or there might at least be like a white paper and like an investment company that's trying to, to, to pitch it, you know? Um, oh, it's like, being talked about in rooms yeah. right this minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, and, and something else. Someone's I, like, I, have you seen The Island by Michael Bay, 2005? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, something else I, I did like about the movie too is, um, which again, sophisticated is perhaps um, uh, uh, too generous, but I uh, wasn't expecting the first time that I saw it way back in 2005 is, so, you know, they they, they go on the lamb and uh, they're, they're Ewan McGregor and Scarlett Johansson's plans are to find the people that they're cloned from and, and you know, blow... You know, it, once the truth gets out, right? Uh, because uh, as as B was was uh, explaining, they they lie to the to the people who have bought these clones, right? And it's like, oh mm -hmm. well, you know, when they find out that 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 actually we're we're people, then they're they're going to help shut this down, right? And Ewan McGregor finds the person that he that he's cloned from, and he uh, is an absolute prick and doesn't care, right? He wants he wants that liver, um, and you know, I I wasn't <laughs> yeah, I didn't see he that had coming. Too much sex, and he has hepatitis now. Yes. Like I was, yeah. I did not remember that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> at all i feel like that was probably a really fun scene for ian mcgregor to film like that you know a hundred percent um essentially playing himself but jerkier you know like yeah um well and there's like I, it was interesting you pointed that out too john because i was I, I was wondering like is there a gnostic myth or a myth period about like finding sort of the the higher version of yourself or the realer version of yourself but then it's inverted here because they're an asshole. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, like if if he's an um, if he is an echo of his of his source, you know. But to have the the echo be more ethical, do you know what I mean? Like, what's what's going on there? Is there a is it uh, is it because they're childlike and therefore haven't been corrupted by the world? I don't know. Like. Um, I think that's that's what the movie's getting at, and and that's that's where we can't quite one to one with a lot of Gnostic mythologies, because there is mythology, you know, particularly among, among the Valentinians, where we actually have a divine double, right? But who is a, basically a superior version of us, but is us, but it is is still in the pleroma. Um, mm -hmm. But that's actually something else. If, if you were going to take a, a Gnostic interpretation of this movie, where, where things do get get kind of fun, right? Because uh, both this and the Matrix do something very smart, which is the you. you have this illusionary world which in many ways is, is very pleasant right so if you're going to do a one-to-one -one of gnosticism it, it turns out this pleasant world is a trap and there's actually a better world out there that it might be a sacrifice to get to it but you want to get to it but in the uh in the matrix when they get to quote unquote the real world it's garbage right it's it's shit compared to the matrix and even in this movie you know the 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 life that they lead in the in the bunker you know isn't isn't paradisical but uh they are all their needs are taken care of they, they do they are for the most part happy and content and when you watch this movie again you know from from 2005 to now right if, if you're paying three thousand dollars rent for a, for a one-room apartment you'll be watching this movie and be like you know that bunker is a pretty sweet deal <laughs> you know like this is a pretty good <laughs> life 
So, yeah. so, so something that, that's actually pretty, pretty advanced is is the fact that you know the the world that the dude McGregor and Scarlett Johansson escaped to is in many ways a better one, but it's it's not paradise. It's not the Pleroma. It's not heaven. It's it's our world. It's flawed and it's broken and it's pretty fucked up. Um, and Matrix uh, does that. Uh, you know, one 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 more, one above, where we're quote unquote the real world is um uh is insanely horrible. And in some ways, I I think that this this idea of the real, this embrace of the real, is in some ways more sophisticated than 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 some of the Gnostics and Gnostic myths. I don't know why. I'm saying sophisticated a lot it's something that no, i like no. a lot it's great it's great philosophical things to think about right which is you know um um and something else that the movie does very well which which i think is part of the the gnostic message part of the gnostic myth which we also find in the matrix is is the 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 start the the first experience of of divine reality the start to getting to reality the end of the illusion is 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 not joyful but painful right it's unpleasant you know it's an inbreaking of something that that is that is horrible you know uh and uh traumatic um and and i think that's something that that both movies get very well sorry jason i went on a long rant i want to ask uh, answer your question quite uh, uh quite directly which is I think sometimes, a lot of times, the interpretation of the Gnostic myth is is that there's there's a real us that comes with the pleroma that's covered up from from material from the from the archons, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, but in my reading of Secret John, and I'm not saying that that that's an invalid interpretation, but but, but specifically the the Secret Book of John, there's not a fully formed identity, right? There's there's just potential, there's energy that that comes from Sophia and is um uh, is then deposited into this reality and ends up in us, right? And that's mm -hmm. that you know that is not a, a fully formed soul soul or personality. Um, so the what we think of as us is is a lot of it is archonic, right? A lot of it comes mm -hmm. from the archons. So you know if you're going to look at at this movie, you know the it want to have like a strong gnostic uh, interpretation. Well, you know actually the you know the the divine double is not a divine double, but it's actually the archon, right? So as you're saying, Jason, the the echo is actually better. Right, because you know mm -hmm. we're in some ways we're echoes of the Archon, but because we have the, the divine spark, the, uh, the the potential that comes from Sophia, we are uh, superior. So you know the, you could actually get a, a pretty uh, I'm not going to say sophisticated again, advanced Gnostic interpretation <laughs> of, of this movie, um, where you know, where where the where the clones are superior, the clones are better, um, yeah, and, and they're they're more pure than 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 the Archons that they're cloned from. Mm -hmm. There is also kind of a uh, like. So there's like if you sort of assume a gnostic literary theory approach like we on one hand we can like we're making the correlations in the story if it's a gnostic metaphor or we're 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 um suggesting a gnostic metaphor even if one doesn't exist but then there's also like the gnostic literary theory of approaching it from the from like if neither echo or uh the the um Ewan McGregor's uh, um Whatever his whatever the Tom. jerk character is, Tom. Yeah, if either Echo or if neither Echo or Tom, um, if like if we're not seeing them as one as higher and one as lower, but both as as essentially like uh, examples of the kind of what you're talking about, like um, Tom is has been fully arcanized. You know what I mean? Um, by being enmeshed in our modern world, whereas uh, good old Echo in his like in in this like sort of um infantilized world has none has been has been allowed to like remain uh less influenced by that you know so that's like i don't think that's a that's not a um a narrative that the movie is pushing but i think there's like a gnostic theory idea that you could you could carry there definitely yeah yeah um i think the uh, the upbringing of the clones is really interesting to look at as well. So it's the first thing that we as an audience see, uh, but we don't know what we're seeing yet. Uh, we're seeing this dream of Lincoln's. And so a lot of it is uh, fragmented with these memories that Jason mentioned earlier that he's having that are actually Tom's memories that have seeped in somehow in his in DNA or his programming. But a lot of what the fragmentation of the dream that we're seeing is actually what they show to all of the clones as they're being created. Like, mm -hmm. so, Oh yeah. Like shots of the Island and yeah. yeah. And like this, it is brainwashing. It's programming neural programming that they're doing to these clones. 
but it very much is like, you are special. You have a purpose. Mm -hmm. You will be going mm. to the island. Like you have survived the contamination because you are meant to be here. And then it's all of these um, childhood memories that like every girl sees that. I mean, the, this is an incredibly binary movie. Like <laughs> yes. every girl sees the same little girl on a bicycle and every boy sees the same like t-ball game or whatever, you know? Yeah. But <laughs> but there are like there's this neural programming that they are implementing onto these clones. And I think Sean Bean says it again quite openly to someone <laughs> in the movie uh, that he knew that they needed to be infused with a purpose. They that this idea of purpose needed to be part of the clones education or upbringing or, or brainwashing, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, this like island propaganda, because that would keep them striving for something while actually being very controlled and, and in prison. And so I think that's interesting from a Gnostic lens as well mm -hmm. of this, they're almost creating their own collective consciousness because these clones all have the same memories and the same knowledge of themselves and the way and the rules of the world um, but it's actually not not a collective consciousness it's like very clearly been given to them and so then when when new memories and new streams of consciousness are reaching the clones through means that they you know the creators don't understand i do think not to use sophisticated again but i do think there's an element of like real deep thought there that is in the script yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah um do you know what part i really liked was when that that thing went boom like it blew up <laughs> sure 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 oh that i really like that it was the most um, sophisticated explosion <laughs> yeah moving on i do i do have a question for both of you uh the one one other thing that, that that's really funny about this movie because it does take place in in the future as bees mentioned a few times the uh the the advanced Our past uh, yeah uh, uh future of 2019 <laughs> but it, it is really funny because they have like these like there's like hover like, there is advanced technology there's like hover cars and these hover bikes but there's also just tons of obviously like gas burning uh vehicles um and they're just mixed in together so it's just like obviously shot in 2005 with like some uh, technology mash in that doesn't make any sense if you think about it for five minutes. And that's also for budgetary reasons and also the, the cars are product placements. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. Can't yeah. forget this, that. <laughs> like, it, I bet you this movie was probably cheaper than The Matrix to make. Yeah. Ooh, you know? okay. So that actually, so I made some friends of mine watch this with me when I rewatched it. It was a great experience. We all just kept shouting out movies we thought this movie was trying to be like the whole time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, but then because I have nerd friends, we all looked up trivia afterwards. And I got to say, Michael Bay has ha said some wild things about this movie. <laughs> so first of all, uh, it, he absolutely was hoping that this movie would make a lot of money. I do think it was very expensive to make and it didn't make a lot of money. It actually, he, out of his own mouth, was like the worst opening of any film that he's ever made and it made the least amount of money and he was very openly upset that it did not do as well financially as his other movies. Uh, and then he also had a lot of very weird things to say about Scarlett Johansson that, again, if you, like, read his direct quote, you're like, absolutely not. Did that, like, that never happened. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Like, he was, imagine. he was very, she wouldn't come out of her trailer to wear this, to uh, film the sex scene in the movie because of something that he calls like a syndrome that women have about leaving their trailers. It is oh. wild. It's wild. And then he says oh that her, God. her issue with the sex scene was actually that her bra was too quote unquote ghetto. And she actually wanted to do the whole scene nude, <laughs> which I'm sure an actress at that time was very excited to be new oh. for Michael Bay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. No, the budget is, I think it was something like $125 million in two, uh, 2005 money, which is almost $200 million now. So it was, it had a, it had a huge, huge budget. It was budget. very you know, expensive. And yeah. I, I, I just took a look and uh, uh, The Matrix was $63 million 
and this wow. was 125. So I think there's 126. So that's interesting. Like, it's interesting that I thought it was cheaper. Yeah. You know, um, and maybe that's because of all the product placement and the uh, like. And the things you know, going boom. The things going boom. That but really also, adds like, up. <laughs> but also like the lack of invention in the, if that makes sense, like the uh, in terms of the things that I was seeing, like the the um, it, it looked like they found sound stages they already had, you know, Absolutely. Um, and buildings they already had and like cars they had on license kind of thing. Like so, um, yeah, that's that's <laughs> interesting that something was more expensive, but looked less. Yeah, mm -hmm. I uh, I have an So, you know, um, I think we've got a pretty great podcast here and with talk gnosis, you know, we've been at it for 10 years and, you know, in podcast terms, we, we don't get the hugest audience in the world, but we still get something about 3000 per show. Right. And of course they live online so they, they can keep going. And like, I don't know 3000 people. I, I've rarely spoken to an audience of 3000 people. So statistically 3000 people are, are listening and watching this. And, and the, even though we told them to stop and, and watch the movie, you know, there's going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who are not going to watch the island so be and jason i have one question for you what is oh, the boy. island <laughs> we have, <laughs> we have oh it yet. i oh yeah do you yeah. want to say do you want no, me to no, say? Please. yeah go yeah 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 well the island is the lie that they're told you know that so all of these there's been this great contamination and so now we humans have to live in this bunker but the island is the one uncontaminated place left on earth and you win a lottery to be able to go to the island. So everybody is hopeful every night that they will win the lottery. But really it's just that your human that you have been cloned after is ill or needs to cash in on your body. And so when you are chosen to go to the island, you die actually, you, you are, they perform surgery on you. They take the parts that they need. Someone has a baby, you know, as a surrogate in the, in the movie, and that's actually the the reveal of the first clone is that this woman has a baby, and so she said that once the baby is born, they both can go to the island, and then the baby is taken and given to a woman who looks exactly the same as the woman who has just given birth. So yeah, the island is is not real. Well, actually, Scarlett Johansson does think the island is real. She thinks it's the love that she has with. You and McGregor yes. in that fabulous line quote the island is real it's us I, <laughs> I lost it I lost it at that moment you know yeah, okay probably. but here's the thing that line is so cheesy yeah but I feel like there is kind of an element of truth there that like that the um uh like so I'm going to go in a few different places here, but like on Gnostic, like, you know, subreddits and, and like lots of like uh, physical and online conversations, there's often this, this, like I find people will, especially when they early come to Gnosticism, they're looking for the new answer, if that makes sense. Like they, they, uh, th th it appeals to them, but they want the new answer that now answers everything. This is why, like, this is why God is bad, or this is why bad things happen or whatever. And this is what happens when we die. Like, this is it. Here's the new heaven that I now get to go to or what have you. Clear answers. Um, but I think, like, what Gnosticism is often trying to say is, is like, no, there is no, th there is no easy answer here. There's no chance for you to now go to the right heaven. Heaven was inside you all along. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the divine spark has been inside you the whole time. And so there is, like, I, yeah. So, again, I feel like the, as, as cheesy as that line is, there is also kind of that sense of like, yeah, you you can't you can't wait for someone else to give you your prize, you know. I don't know. Am, am I off base there? No, all right. no, I don't think no. so at all. Because I I think you're right, and it's interesting too that you're saying like we're just looking for a recapitulation of the same story in something that makes a little bit more sense or or resonates with our worldview a little bit, like when we're first getting into Gnosticism. Um, and so I think it is interesting that we also are talking about this movie as a recapitulation of like so many ideas and mm -hmm. um, amalgamations of stories that have come before. But I think that is the, that is, you know, the questioning nature of Lincoln and the idea that there wouldn't be this physical external paradise for them to go to, but that when they 
uh, do come into the real world and they are able to actually lean into those feelings and like attractions that they are clearly having for each other, which we haven't talked about the proximity oh boy. <laughs> um, component, but like um, the, there are, you know, in the bunker, like the clones aren't allowed to be that close and everyone's kind of taken notice that, that these two are, are gravitating towards each other. So when they are able to lean into that, you know, in the real world together, then I do think that there is, yes, cheesy, but there is some poetry to the idea that they would even have the awareness that they don't need this external place if they are able to find this connection with each other. And I think I've said this on the on some episode before, but for me and my personal approach to spirituality, I always need it to have some practical application in the real world mm -hmm. because that's all I can prove exists or that's all I understand, right? I can only see what's right in front of me and interact with what's going on. And so at the end of the day, I am always open to that every story or every answer is just somebody's theory and we won't actually know. Uh, and so I think what you were saying, Jason, was a little bit like that. Like if we... Mm -hmm if we can let go of these ideas of heaven or the island or paradise or whatever that is and focus more in on what is here in front of us and how do we work with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do we sink into that? Yeah, I think there's something there. Absolutely. It's, it's, I mean, you're both playing on my favorite theme, uh, my favorite thing to rant about, which is, you know, a lot of modern interpretations of Gnosticism and a lot of people who, who call themselves Gnostics or want to be Gnostic. And I, I suspect many of them are, are 15 years old and on Reddit. Right. So I'm not, you know, I'm not I'm not saying I, I, I just don't want to come across as superior, uh, where, uh, which, of course, <laughs> I never do. But I mean, thinking that I'm superior. Is what I don't want to come across as because uh, everybody has wisdom and, and people are, are, are at different states. But to make a long story short, I really don't like the interpretation of Gnosticism that it's the body is bad and if you do the following things and you get to go to super heaven when you die, right? I mean, the, the evangelicals say the same thing, right? The body is bad and when you die, you get to go to super heaven if you do the right things. So I, I think what, you, what both of you are talking about is... Um, you know, moving moving away from that narrative, interrogating that narrative, uh, having different narratives, and uh, I really I really appreciate that. Even even if you're not particularly talking about that that formulation or that bugaboo of mine, so uh, yeah. Well, but no, like a hundred percent. I think the um, uh, to me, like one of the things that I define as important as a Gnostic is is never being settled. You know, ne yeah. never having a single. Uh, um, process by which you can you can like answer all Gnostic questions. Um, but that is also kind of like that can be terrifying, you know, to say to say to somebody like, no, it turns out there actually are like <laughs> it's th there never was an answer <laughs> or there never was an answer I can give you and then you can stop looking, you know, yeah. um, it's it's only ever going to take more work. Um, and that, yeah, like, I think, if anything, I think, like, the, the narrative we need is a narrative that continues to ask us to question narratives, you know, um, that doesn't just kind of try to map a new one on top. Yeah. Um, and I, and I and, said, I, it's, it's funny that we've never talked about that this is the most important thing for Gnosticism between the two of us, Jason, but it, we are completely simpatico, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I think I've, I've said that line, right? Gnosticism is just a narrative that that questions all narratives, including its own narratives. Um, it, it's a very uh, a ancient form of that. And it's um, it's, it's it's a religion that's uh, that's cynical and interrogative of, of religion. Um, and, you know, again, going back to Secret John, as well as, you know, most all our iterations of, of the Gnostic myth, uh, all of this starts um and there's some a lot of bad results from god just trying to know itself right you know god's wisdom sophia tries to know itself and then pff, here we are right and there's uh there's flies eating children's eyeballs um so i i think that this this constant interrogation this constant wanting to know and not being settled that that this that this is um, uh, frequently uh, difficult and unpleasant, and maybe there isn't a safe harbor. And, and I think the myth does kind of talk about that. That when, even when God tries to know itself, it, it it can't it can't be achieved, or it can't be achieved instantly. And a lot of uh, uh, stuff arises out of that that is very unsettling. The unsettling mm -hmm. thing being creation. Um, so uh, <laughs> uh, I I think too never never knowing that. Uh, I, 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 and you know i can't prove this but there's um 
the, the heresiologists, um, there's debate if the Gnostics actually call themselves Gnostics, right? Um, it's a dumb debate because the answer is yes, they did. But the, the heresiologists... <laughs> <laughs> the heresiologists, the people that didn't like them, that wrote about them, called them called them Gnostics as, as a joke because they're like these, these are the people who don't know, like they're they're being ironic. But but I can't prove this, but it doesn't matter because modern interpretations are also valid. But but I think there actually is something ironic with the Gnostics calling themselves Gnostic because you know they were big fans of Plato, they're big fans of Socrates, and Socrates was the wisest man because he said, "I know that I don't know." And uh, the Gnostics, I think that their their knowing was an unknowing, and uh, you know we we kind of find this in some of the texts where where you have what they call negative theology, and we're not calling a negative negative theology because sometimes their theology is is a bit of a downer, but because you can only know you, God God can't be described by words, so you say things like God is God is a being, but God is not a being, right? The, the or the one I should be saying in 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 uh, terms. So you, so you talk about what the one, the monad or God isn't, um, and, and that's a kind of unknowing put into words so uh, i often think that the the wisdom of the gnostics is is the knowledge of unknowing i think there might actually be a little bit of irony there so mm -hmm. um i'm just rambling i'm not really talking about the island anymore but but i think this unknowing is uh and this, this challenge to narratives is um is is uh, very important um yeah so my rant's over um there's a uh I've got a whole bunch of ideas that came out of that, but the, but one thing that I did want to mention, going back to be your your question about uh, or your, like your, your note, like so at the end of the clones are just free. What's going on there? Mm -hmm. But again, maybe w one thing that is kind of again connected to this this like positive interpretation or like this um, like a, a positive telling of uh, what what would be a good Gnostic impulse, which is to be to be able to freely explore meaning. You know, mm. like uh, that they like they get to kind of get dropped into the modern world, but not have been formed by it. You know, um, so there is kind of an interesting like <laughs> is it, <laughs> the Gnostic rebirth is that like you get to break out of this like prison world uh, that w that seemed like heaven, but was just using you and you break out to a worse world, but that you get to define, you know uh versus one that that's either being handed to you or that has corrupted you yeah absolutely i don't know i don't yeah. know well and also the boat so the boat is right, the, the boat, boat shows up <laughs> in the very first dream that we see lincoln is dreaming of this boat and he knows the name of this boat and it's this latin word and it's the first thing that pings sean bean as like there's a problem here with lincoln he's not supposed to know this boat and we realize later it's because the boat is has been designed by tom the man the human man that ewan mcgregor plays mm -hmm. both him and the clone Oh, my dog is very upset that we're not done yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, too much of the island, please. <laughs> um, but well, we're going to go the full two hours and 16 minutes, the length of the island. <laughs> we, uh, yes, buckle up, Gus. It's going to be a long ride. Um, Wait for the so, live stream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that'll be shorter because, yeah, because I will have right. edited the action That's right. sequences. <laughs> yeah. um, so this boat it turns out that it's been designed by Ewan McGregor's human and human version. And actually the name of it is Latin for rebirth. Mm -hmm. So I actually, yes. and they say that in the movie, <laughs> yes. And so I wrote it down. I felt so silly taking notes on this, but I was like, there is a cool metaphor going on here of like this boat being both a rebirth and a vessel and like an you know, an opportunity, like a vehicle to his new life, because the end of the movie is that both Scarlett Johansson and Ewan McGregor's clones have conveniently died over the course of the movie. And so it is not said whether, like, ScarJo doesn't really take the place of her clone, but Ewan McGregor absolutely takes over the place of his human. Oh, sorry, of his human. So um, there's this whole switcheroo in mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. movie where uh, they, the two of them get caught together and the, their pursuer can't figure out which one is the clone and which one is Ewan McGregor for real. Um, and so Lincoln makes this really smart last minute decision to put his clone bracelet onto the human um, and the human is killed. And so then he, he takes over as Tom. 
So I do think there is this, there is some depth to this movie, just in that I, I, I have to say some thought went into this and I will, I will give it that uh, because the, the boat being actually named rebirth and being this through line. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's some depth there. You know, like, uh, I have no idea if this would ever happen, but like, just in case the filmmakers, like the screenwriters would ever be watching or listening to this. I also want to say too, like, I get how note sessions work. I get how the, 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 the machinery of filmmaking and how like a lot of our teasing of this movie uh, and our, our sort of diminuations of the, of, of the plot and the, the development of it. Like I get how those choices were made. You know, I get how the sandwich was made. <laughs> and this is also like, this is a very, mid 90s to mid 2000s kind of film as well like there was a formula there was a formula about how to shoot things and how to write things and like if you wanted the movie made you had to do those things too so i feel like it's worth just giving them giving the the writers uh, some credit that they didn't they probably didn't blunder into some of this stuff that they were probably trying to filter like get it through the filter of the of the film filmmaking um there was a uh what was i going to say there um I just I'm just looking at some of my other notes. Like I think uh, just a couple of like going back to the dopamine thing connections that I thought that I that I was like, oh, that's interesting. Of um, I think it's interesting that the the lottery that sends people to the island, people follow the rules of it, but they also kind of already think that the game might be fixed. That's interesting. Um, so even within the the bunker, it's not like uh, everyone's not completely idyllic and, and innocent. Um, one of them thinks he might've figured out the system. And I'm like, that guy's doing gematria. Like, <laughs> I literally that... wrote down, I was like, this is numerology. Like this is yeah. so esoteric. Like there's a whole cipher system. He thinks he's figured out numbers equals letters equals whatever. I'm like, yeah. And, and talking yeah. about clones, I was watching this movie and you know, I said to my wife and it's like, oh, you know, I, I always love it when Wallace Shawn pops up in a movie. And she's like, that's not Wallace Shawn. So there's a Wallace Shawn-esque actor in this movie. Who's perhaps a clone? So, of Wallace Shawn, it's of Wallace. Wallace Shawn's clone starring in the island. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we actually are. I, I know uh, that you know we, we are coming up on an hour, so you know we, we have to talk about cramming all the really important stuff that we we didn't talk about, right? Uh, the, you know, as we're going through our, our extensive notes, which which means that you know I very quickly have to talk about Ewan McGregor's frosted tips, which is the clone <gasps> yes. has the frosted tips. He has, he has yes, my, yes, yes, <laughs> it's my ear. <laughs> so it's the post-apocalyptic world, and uh, you, again, we keep talking about this being a 2005 movie. But Scarlett Johansson has like these horrible layers. She kind of looks like Christina Aguilera at the time. Her brows. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a it's a real trip, folks. So oh, see, you see thing. horrible, but I thought she was banging. I was like, this this movie is a mid two thousands bisexual dreamscape. I mean, come on. Uh, the I'm so glad the the, the frosted tips actually that came up. Uh, uh, my partner and I were watching it, and she was like, "Why do the clones have frosted tips? Who is frosting the tips of the clones? Why would the clones want their tips frosted?" But here's my gnostic interpretation. It is because as they're more innocent, uh, they are closer to their divine spark, and and that energy is what is what like it's it's completely natural. There's no there's no die jobs happening in the you know in the salons of the bunker. This is like their innocence their enlightenment, is frosting. Like exactly. literal, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm I I could get behind that theory. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go get some frosted tips tomorrow. I think it would really help us all. Yeah, let's all get frosted tips. You know, sometimes people all get tattoos together, but we'll do. Yeah, we'll do frosted incredible, tips. Incredible, incredible! Yeah. That's the official uniform of pop noses. Or yeah. The frosted tips. Yeah. Oh um, actually, Jason, you you get the frosted tips. I'll grow up my hair and get the scarjo uh, layers. So. The layers, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I actually, we did look this up after. This was Scarlett Johansson's first action role. So really? I do think that Michael Bay could take some credit for Black Widow for her Marvel career if Absolutely. he wanted to. Because I think this was I'm a real sure precursor. <laughs> I'm I'm very sure. She was like, she just wanted to be naked for me. And also I made her Black Widow. So you're um. welcome. <laughs> The uh, what are some other other notes that I wanted to make here before we go? Um, yeah, I think like I I remember took I took a note here about um, that heaven gives them meaning, which I think like, just going back to that notion of how like 
in the bunker, there's a clear narrative about like how things work, which I think we, we already alluded to, but I just wanted to like point that out again. Um, and then uh, there is also like, we haven't talked about the, the mercenary too much. There's yep. this like oh, yeah. hunter mercenary guy. And I was like, mythologically, what, where, where does he sit? Like, he's kind of this grim reaper figure, like maybe like a, like an archangel of death, but like not an archangel of death in a, uh, like he's not punishing because he's got his own moral questions about what's going on. You know, like he's kind of not sure what he should be doing. So yeah, like I, it, it, he sort of struck me as an interesting uh, uh, position inside this overall narrative. And well, he flips sides. There is, in, in some of the Gnostic mythologies, there's one of the Archons, uh, Sabaoth, uh, he, he changes sides, so he, he mm. comes onto our side. So that's that's definitely what the authors of this uh, screenplay were thinking of. With that definitely. Character. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> no, but he is interesting because he, uh, he abstains, essentially, for most of the movie from having an ethical viewpoint. And it's only through seeing more of the facility and actually interacting with the clones that he is like, oh, actually I might be, you know, helping out the wrong side. But I yeah. do think his position is very interesting in it because he's originally called, Sean Bean calls him specifically because the clone company the clone company um <laughs> has government contracts and they say that the press even the president of the united states has a clone in the bunker and so he doesn't want the government to know that the clones are sentient human beings either so he mm -hmm. calls in this third party whose only allegiance is to keeping the confidence of his clients. And so I do think there's a real, like he's an interesting character because he serves his own interests. Sure. He's like, self, you know, self-employed instead of working for a corporation or the government. Um, but at the same time, he really does kind of pledge his allegiance to whoever is hiring him at the time. And mm -hmm. then you watch him grapple with his own understanding of ethics as well. Totally. Totally. Um, anything that you've got on that, John? Any, like, I guess you already mentioned that. What's his name? Sa Sabo? Yeah, Sabo for Sabio. Yeah. And sometimes, uh, I think sometimes Abraxas is, is, is that figure as well. And arguably Judas in the Gospel of Judas. You can you, you can say that all those are, are people who uh, are constant hmm. flip sides. So. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's definitely my the, the correct interpretation of that. Um the definitely correct. Uh, yeah. The uh, one really just quick thing again. This is very much like a Matrix connection, but I think it's interesting that he, that um, Echo discovers the outside world or like cracks through by following a bug. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. He follows the uh, the butterfly, I think it is. Um, so again, there's sort of an interesting thing of like both the natural world, but also like a non non mammalian, like a, an insectoid thing that you know kind of helps drag him out. Was interesting to me. Um, and then I like this might be the last note that I've that I've got or the last question that I've got. But like I think it was interesting about these. Like was there something there about the organs, like um, that? Oh right, yeah. The reason that they couldn't just clone a brainless body is because the organs needed to be inside like a living person. And so the note I took is like, oh, so the organ needs a soul to operate. You know, like. And I again, I don't know if there's a Gnostic interpretation there, but it but it was sort of like the implied, you know, like they they never gave a scientific explanation. It was one of those things where like we don't know why the brain. Uh, oh, Jonathan just disappeared. Oh, maybe his he's out. Maybe his, maybe you... his clone <laughs> <laughs> just knocked on the door. Um, but uh, yeah, like um, the, the story never says. Oh, like it, it's for this scientific reason that the that the organ can't work. The story just says no. For some reason, they need it needs to be in a living body. But then I'm like, but there's also like the living body has a soul, or at the very least, an individual personality. Well, know? and a wisdom too. I think yeah. there is an intelligence to the body that is divine, and so that is why I can't get behind some of the more cynical, you know, down with matter Gnostic theory. 
uh, as well, because there's so much that happens within us all of the time that we have no control, like conscious control over or knowledge of, like all of the body systems that are functioning always without us doing anything. So I, I do think that was one of the, you know, they, the movie didn't attempt to really answer to answer no. that, yeah, nor I, I did it answer. Do they just take out one organ and then they're well, done? Way, I was wondering that. Yeah, it's like, do they just put the rest in the garbage or what are we, what are we uh, doing yeah, here? Yeah, because they can't go back into Gen Pop because they've yeah. gone to the <laughs> island, so yeah. there can't be a new one made. So I, I do have some questions about, like. You've yeah. grown this whole person, so I guess like whichever organ goes first, you get one shot. <laughs> well, and, clone. Yeah, well, I I, I think uh, they they've numbered like the the numbers of the clones. Like, there's probably a lot of Toms. You know what I mean? There's a lot yeah. of Tom clones. Um, uh, not Tom Jones, Tom clones. Um, Tom <laughs> but the uh, Tom Jones cover band. <laughs> Tom clones. <laughs> Oh my god. Um the uh so yeah, like it's um it's probably like there there's there might be other toms in Gen Pop, you know, um on different levels. Maybe they like keep them separate or something. Like or or yeah. maybe they like the movie never addresses it, but I like that was kind of all my my sort of personal thing. But like is there a is there a connection that we can make, you know, again, not that the movie is saying, but that is, that could be interesting, you know, about that notion of like, I think, I think you kind of touched on it there, B, I think about the notion that, that the body does need the mind, you know, like that, uh, you know, like if, or John, you were saying like, if, if like we're here or if like reality exists because God needed to experience itself, like, then that's not a inherently bad thing, you know? And so experiencing the body, experiencing like, that's why we can't just be a brain in a jar or a brain in a jar connected to various organs that are just doing separate things. It has to be connected. It has to be integrated and processing. I'm kind of brainstorming this as I talk about it. Yeah, no, I wonder there's, if there's something here about um, something being like a whole instead of individual parts, uh, you know, like the body as a whole functioning system instead mm. of kind of piecemealed. I mean, you could get back to collectivism versus individualism here if you really wanted to. Yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> there's, I mean, like, there's also kind of a. Um, uh, Ellen Moore has talked about uh, this idea that our culture has gone through a whole lot of, through its through, through its a lot of its scientific progress has separated a lot of things. Uh, so it's gone through the the alchemical like solve et coagula. It's gone through a lot of solve separating 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 mm. defining 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 but that what is necessary is also then a coagula putting it all back together and so like yeah again i don't think the movie is saying that <laughs> right, right, um, right. but but i think it's an interesting idea about like where would the value come from that would make it an automatic yes in the movie that that organs need bodies or sorry organs need people you know they can't just be grown by themselves and of course, you know the real reason for that is it's 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 just a, a plot hole that they <laughs> that they just had to wave their hand at, or there was there exactly because exactly. everybody watching is like, well, why why don't they just grow the organs? The Matrix, <laughs> does, the Matrix does the same thing because it's like they just hand wave and uh, uh, because it's uh, they they say that oh you know we had to plug you into the Matrix you had to have lies we couldn't just like grow you as bodies right and then there's no mm -hmm. explanation ever why so um, so that's that's the real reason. However, I'm glad that it has started. Uh, a great uh, inquiry of uh, of um, uh, uh, philosophical uh, uh, um, uh, deepness, and of course we don't know. Like the, the, the folks were recording this in 2023, the world might still be mostly wiped out at any moment. There could be a post-apocalyptic uh, 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 scenario, and maybe the only the only thing that will survive from the 20th and 21st centuries is a copy of the island, and people will be like, okay, well, what's this? You know, this this this, this our holy work. You know, there is this reference to how how the bodies, you know, they they need to be in sold like and then and you people will write grand treatises and there will be schisms about that and uh huge debates and that's what will form the next society will be you guys the discussions somebody's, on that one line somebody's gonna find on a usb stick uh like this episode like centuries after the island becomes the, that core text and we're gonna start a like a whole new like schism 
Oh, that's I right, was going right. to say, if this episode isn't a part of this future theology, I'm going to be very upset. What about my legacy? Yeah, it'll be found in, in an Egyptian desert. Uh, so, in a pot. Uh, in a pot. Yeah. And, and the followers, uh, you'll always be able, to be able to identify the followers of this, of this schism by their frosted tips. Yes. Perfect. We've done it. We've done it. Well... Um, this is a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, we can't top that. One thing I would like to say to anybody listening um, is, uh, yeah, like uh, I, I think we've thrown out a lot of cool ideas here. But if you have ideas that we didn't cover, um, then like pop them in the in the comments. Um, you know, offer other opinions. Disagree with us on any of this stuff. Um, yeah, let us know what you think. Yeah, and uh, welcome. Um, uh, come welcome. Uh, what I meant to say was come and join us for our next show on the Rock. Um, which I think you can get a Gnostic. Okay, so Nick Cage is Jesus, right? Gnostic Jesus. He's breaking into the prison, right? To okay, I'm doing. Save it, it. Save it for the yeah, show. Yeah, save it. Yeah, yeah. Don't give all your best stuff away now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that might actually have to happen. Um, but yeah, any any closing thoughts beyond the frosted tips? Oh, sorry, I, I, have, I have a few more th 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 uh, admin stuff. But anyone else have any any uh, last thoughts? Oh, yeah. I have one last thought about the actual movie. So yeah. um, I thought it was really interesting. The bunker life is not that different from any kind of dogmatic society or even, I'm sure, some Gnostic societies. And obviously, this is very cultish as well, which some of these early early communities like the Pythagoreans, um, we can't say that wasn't a cult. Uh, we just don't really <laughs> view it on the you know through that lens. But this like full control of diet, of exercise, of mood, of um, proximity to others, of relationship, of knowledge, you know, this kind of full control from from kind of up above or this code of conduct that everyone, mm -hmm. you know, in a society, we would hope everyone would be agreeing to that and coming to um, that decision of their own accord. But I thought it was really interesting, kind of this parallel between some of these like early religious or philosophical communities and kind of how they were being held and, and what standards they were being held to like in mm -hmm. the bunker. Totally. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. There's also, uh, John, do you have any last thoughts? But I, I, I'll comment on what you just said there, B. Well, you know, after watching the movie, I, I really want to get some Aquafina bottled water. I really want to buy some Puma shoes. Uh, I need a Mercedes. I'm trying to think. Uh, that's I don't know why, but this is the thoughts that are running through my head after watching this. MSN. You want a, yes, a, that's a right. subscription just, yeah. to MSN, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you kind of touched on it earlier, B, just with the, your, your last comment touched on something even earlier about a notion of like uh, individualization versus collectivization um, and like the, the challenges of forming communities um, that are not dogmatic is also like a whole thing. Um, but there is, yeah, I think there is something interesting about how the movie is, is uh, like sort of generally critical of, of any sort of top-down um, uh, control. That is, you know, there any dogmatic, obvious control. Um, they're less. <laughs> the the movie has less of a problem with the uh, more subtle controls of branding, <laughs> advertising. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like right. The movie um, itself is an influencer. However, it would tell you it would not like an influencer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what? Absolutely, everybody is doing being an individual. <laughs> That's the, the yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so this movie, or sorry, this podcast is not sponsored by Michelob, but uh, it does have Patreon su supporters. And if you wanted to be one of those, we'd love to have you. Uh, Patreon.com slash Gnostic. Um, and, you uh, hypothetically yeah. get early access to the shows, uh, <laughs> which will which will happen again soon. Um, exactly. And you hypothetically get an invite to our, our Discord, uh, which is hopping. But uh, there are there are going to be things coming for. I say this uh, all the time for years. Thanks for, for everybody who gives us money, by the way, uh, uh, to keep the show going out of the goodness of your hearts. But someday we're going to give you some kind of reward. Uh, we're working on it. And I mean, honestly, also to helping support the show is at the very least help makes the show happen, makes yeah. it happen, and and the more support we get probably the faster it'll happen so that's another another offer as well but uh patreon.com slash gnostic 
second. Yeah. Also, I want to be on the Discord. Okay. Yeah. No, it's hopping. So we uh, we'll get you on there. <laughs> it is. It is hopping. <laughs> Great. But we've 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 got some plans. We've got some ideas. Um, but uh, yeah, I think then that's uh, that's it for me. Um, and uh, thanks very much for all of you for tuning in for uh, John and and B for uh, going to the island with me. Oh wow! <laughs> well. It, the island was us. Yeah, the real island was us. The real island was us. The real island was us. And our frosted tips. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.